We are um, right in the middle of a series called Values. If you're here today and you want to know what our church is all about, well, hey, you picked a really, really great Sunday, actually a really, really great month uh, to come and be a part of the whole month of November, with the exception of November 22nd. I'm still trying to figure out how to work that in, but uh, for the whole month of November, we will be going over our core values. This is what we believe as a church. This is what makes us run, makes us function. This is what we do, is that we uh, are a church of values. We're a church of core beliefs. Beliefs and and these items are something that are maybe not as well known to everybody. Our staff knows them uh, pretty well. I would say my, Chanel and my wife. These are something that we really prayed about uh, in our lives as we came to this church. What we wanted this church to be about. And last week we talked about honor. Can everybody understand why I talked about honor before an election? Does everybody kind of understand why I did that? I really believe that was the Holy Spirit that brought that message to us. And so I want to ask you just to continue in honor. Continue in honoring the position. Continue in honor the people that God has placed in authority over us because that's a theme of the Bible. I love it when people, uh, specifically believers, uh, t- t- treat the Bible as a buffet. I want this, I want this, I don't want that. I would love chicken fingers, don't give me chicken livers. You know, like, like it's just kind of, it's chicken, but you know, there's just parts and pieces that you don't necessarily want to have. I want to tell you, as a loving shepherd and a loving pastor, the Bible is not your buffet. The Bible is a coarse meal. It is a meal that he sits in front of you, and it's, it's, it's almost like mama used to treat you at five years old, eat it. You know, like that's kind of thing. And it's not really the way God is, but I'm just telling you that we got to honor. It's a biblical principle. It's just part of us. If you're going to claim to be a believer, then we have to claim to adhere and be people who are not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. That's good. So last week we talked about honor. As As a church, we believe that we honor up we honor down, and we honor all around. It doesn't matter. We honor the people that are under us. We honor the people that are over us. We honor the people that are our peers and beside us. We honor them. And sometimes that looks a little bit more Mayberry and Andy Griffith uh, than our world looks like today. But I just think that it's very, very important that we honor people. This week, I want to talk about another value that's just as important. That's something that I hopefully is going to speak to you today. And this is the value that as a church, as a staff, We empower people to use their God-given gifts to change Jackson County. Now you say, now shouldn't that be change the world? I'm going to get there in just a second, okay? But that's a core value, a core belief that we have is that we empower. We want to help. We want to guide. We want to direct people to see their God-given potential, to see their God-given gifts. I'm talking specifically about the spiritual gifts that God has placed on the inside of you, and he wants to use those gifts, not so you can look cool, not so you can be all great, not so people can look at you and say, wow, aren't you neat? Doesn't God love you? But he wants you to use those gifts so that you can change Jackson County, so that you can change the world. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 4, it says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace that has been given to each of us. 1 Corinthians 12 says, now you are the body of Christ, but each of you has your own part to play in that body. What are these two scriptures telling us? What does this value tell us about our church? Number one, it should tell us that you have something that God has placed on the inside of you that he wants you to use to help change things in your world. He wants, to have, he wants you to use those things to change stuff that's going on in your world. I'm telling you one more time, you have something special that God just gave you. You have a gift that only God gave you. And when you suppress that gift, when you don't use that gift, you are literally slapping God in the face saying, you don't know what you're doing. I'm not going to use this thing because everybody looking at me, you don't have to be a pastor on a stage in a pulpit with skinny jeans preaching to people for people to see that you've got... When people see that you got some giftings, okay? And y'all can talk about my skinny jeans all you want. Go look at a pair of Wranglers. They're skinny jeans, everybody. (laughs) Boot cut skinny, but they skinny. Um, I just want you to know, you have a part to play. Everybody here has something God has specifically made just 
for you, but he wants you to use it to change the world around you. But secondly, what I want this verse to help us see, these 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 to help us see, is that when you focus on one particular location, it's much more doable. Now, for some of us, you go, wait a minute, the Bible says the world. And, and I agree, the world needs changing, the world needs salvation, the world needs God. I completely agree with that. But Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then he began to dissect what that word world means. He began to say, hey, guess what? The world is your house. The world is your street. The world is your county, 30549. The world is Jackson. The world is Jefferson. God knows Arcade needs Jesus, right? Like, like, like the world is the place that you are, we are around. And when we see, when you talk to missionaries, what you notice is missionaries that we send to the world missions, right? They don't even focus on the world. They focus on the group God's called them to. They focus on the ethnicity, the ethos, the, the language that God has called them to. Guess what, everybody? If you're not overseas and you're not called to go worldwide, guess who the people are that God has called you to? Right here. This is your mission field. Jackson County is your place. Jefferson, Kroger, Publix, Tabos. I mean, like, it all needs Jesus. And we've got to be that agent. We've got to be the people that brings that to the table. And so my job is to not focus on the world that God has not called me to necessarily when I say the world. My job is to call me to the world that he's called me to, my sphere, my area of influence. And so I'm telling you this morning, you think you're not called to a world, but you are. There are about 15,000 people in this city that are your world. There's about 60,000 plus people in this county that are your world. And my fear is, if we focus on the world, and we see what the Bible says, the world, go into all the world and preach the gospel, and, and I've done this so you could change the world, and so many dynamic preachers are saying, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna change the world, and all this kind of stuff. But if you're anything like me, when I see something large, and, and, and very um, hard to uh, encompass, or to think of, hard to comprehend, when I see something that's large, the fear is, my fear is, it becomes too big of a job to do, and we get overwhelmed and we get apathetic. I can't do anything to change the world. Seven billion people. What am I going to do to change the world? I, what, there's, there's countries I don't even speak that language. I don't even go there. I like the food from there, but I'm never going to visit that country, you know? Like, like I, I'm not going to be there. What is this? And all of a sudden, we get this idea that God wants us to change a world, and we know that. But when we think of the world as a globe... As millions, as 198 countries, as thousands of different ethoses, ethnic groups, as we see it, we go, it can get overwhelming. And when it gets overwhelming, you get apathetic, and all of a sudden you say, well, well, I'm just going to sit back. I'm just going to sit in the cheap seats. I'm just not going to do anything because, you know what, that's why I, we send missionaries. That's why we give money. That's why we do this. I'm here to tell you your job is to change your world. Can somebody say Amen. When you look at a big problem and a big project, it can get overwhelming pretty fast. But if you begin to see what God has placed right in front of you, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit begins to speak, and you begin to do things that really matter. My son Judah is seven, and he loves having people over at his house. And whenever he does, his room will inevitably be completely just chaotic, thrown into a mess. I'm talking about like you don't even see the carpet in his room sometimes because he has so many friends. And that's just what they do. I don't understand. It's like they take a bucket and just go, oh, look at all these toys, dump, and like all over the floor to find something. I'm convinced that Satan created three things, cats, Pinterest, and Legos. Come on, somebody. You don't know what I'm talking about. Anybody got a child under the age of 10, you know what I'm talking about. Legos end up in your foot, <laughs> in your vacuum cleaner, in your child's throat. Like, I mean, they, they end up all kinds of different crazy places, but my son's floor is covered in them. And I said, son, go clean your room. <laughs> and he walks up, I, I followed up behind him. He walks in his room, sees the mess before him, and this is what he does. His shoulders just drop. Pastor Ryan says, I do the same thing when I hit a bad golf shot. I'm like, oh, you know, that's what he does. He says, Daddy, I can't do it. And he's a little tenderhearted. You know, he cries, drop of a hat. That's kind of the way he is. And I was the same way. And look how I turned out. So, you know, it's just, uh, he, he, I still cry the drop of a hat. Anyway, 
I, um, I, think, I think that Judah, you know, when you look at, he looks at the room, it's impossible, it's a huge project, can't happen, right? I sit there, I say, hey, Judah, first, why don't you pick up all the Legos? But there's millions, I know. But let's pick up Legos, let's put them on the box. All of a sudden, the Legos are done. Now, it's not that big of a task anymore. Hey, let's put the clothes up. Hey, you know when mom puts clothes on the shelves in your room, you're supposed to put them in the drawer, like that's what's supposed to happen, you know? You know, we give you a bet, make your bet. Like, just little things like that. All of a sudden, it seems like it's a lot more doable. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says that God creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready. It's ready. It's ready. Look at your neighbor say, ready. <laughs> Come on, say, it's ready. It's ready for you to do work we had better start doing. The work he has the thing you're made for, the stuff that he has prepared long ago for you to do, it is ready. Not boiling, not waiting, not on broil, it's, it's ready. Not heating up, not trying to get stuff ready, not marinating, it is ready, he says. Many of you know my um, affinity for loving to communicate with drivers on the road. I really enjoy that. Um, and it's particularly while something bad is happening, I'm just, I'm just that kind of a guy. And um, I've used this illustration two Sundays in a row just to give you a glimpse into my life. Um, you know, people say I'm a bad driver. I'm not a bad driver. People around me are bad drivers. That's, that's what it is. It's like, I don't have ADD. I don't suffer from ADD. Everybody else around me suffers with my ADD. That's, that's what it really means. Um, so, um, I, you know, you, you get to a place uh, at a red light, and everybody knows what's, what's getting ready to happen. You get to a red light, there's a car in front of you, and there's a red light right there, and you're, you're just sitting there minding your own business. The light turns green, and they don't move. <sighs> On their phone, checking their seat belt, resetting their odometer, talking, you know, whatever it is, you're just going, man, what are you doing? And you have two choices in that moment. You can either go, beep, beep, like, hey, God loves you. But can you go? Like, you know, the, like that's, that's the Christian way to do it. Y'all, I ain't Christian all the time. Sometimes, yeah, you know, you just lay on that horn. Let them know I am mad. I need you to move right now. Like, like that's the way I feel. And, I, and I'm telling you, in the same way, whether you're nice about it or mean about it, you're just telling them, hey, the light's green, go. As your pastor, listen to me, I'm telling you, the light's green. The light's green. It's time to go. You see what I'm saying? Are you picking up what I'm throwing down? The light's green. You are waiting. You are waiting on a nudge, on a person, on a sign. You are waiting on something. I'm telling you, the light is green. And I'm your pastor. Honk, honk. <laughs> it's time. That's what the Bible speaks of. In our own ways, in our own lives, that he uses us. Not our own strength, but he uses the giftings he has placed on the inside of us before we were ever born, knowing you're the puzzle piece to fit this puzzle. And he said, I want you to fit there. I want you to sit there. I want you to be there. I want you to do this. And we use our giftings. As a church, we want to be about empowering people, directing them, guiding them to see their God-given potential, use their God-given gifts so they can change the world, yes, but our world is Jackson County. So we got a phrase up on the board that I want everybody to say with me, if you can. Say, I can make a difference. Come on. Make a difference. Say it one more time. Like you're mad that Georgia lost. Come on, say it. That's great. Look at your neighbor, say it. Look at your second choice and say it. That's great. Listen, you can make a difference. You can. You can. Do me a favor. Close your eyes. Say it to yourself. You can. I can. It's not up to Pastor Nick. It's not up to my parents. It's not up to the bishop on TV. It is up to me. I can make a difference. Everybody look up here. You know, every now and then as a pastor, one of the prerequisites of a job is that, uh, of this pr profession and this calling, I would say, is that you have to know the Bible. And I will say, I, I know the Bible fairly well. Read it every day. I, I'm digging into it, really trying to meditate on God's word. That's, that's part of what I'm, I love to do. But every now and then there are verses that just catch you and you think to yourself, have I ever read that before? I know I've read the book of Acts over and over and over. I know I have. I've done it as a church study. I've done it as a Holy Spirit study. I've done it over and over. I've done it personally for me. What is Acts about? I've done that. But there's one verse that I caught just for today. 
that I don't think I've ever seen before. Acts 13, verse 36. It says, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation. When he served God's purpose, when he did what he was supposed to do, when he was do- doing what he was born with, when he used the gifts God gave him, when he used the purpose, when he completed the purpose, served God's purpose in his own generation, the Bible says he fell asleep. Can I tell you something? As a believer, just as a side note, we don't die. Can somebody say amen? We don't die. We never taste death. We simply fall asleep. It's from one moment to the next, and we're in heaven with Jesus. It's that good. It's that awesome. Yes, he's that amazing of a God. But the Bible says David, as great as he was, as many, as many outreaches, as, many, as large as his grasp was, as long as his fingers were, that reached into the world, into the history that we know of the Bible and everywhere else, that when he served his purpose in his generation, that he fell asleep. In the same way, I want that prayer to be for me. I want them to write on my tombstone. I want them to say at my eulogy, which is hopefully a long way away, I want them to say in my eulogy that he served his purpose in his own generation. He did what God called him to do. Because if not, then what are we doing? Have you ever thought about that? If you're not doing what God's called you to do, what exactly are you doing? And will it amount to anything in your life? I think that's a powerful question we have to ask ourselves. I can be a difference maker, but two people we can be difference makers to right now, today, like leaving now, you can do this. Really really applicable, okay? Number one, you can make a, be a difference maker for those closest to you. And that's who God's called you to. We talk about the world. We talk about, you know, going over there to China and Australia and England and the world. And this is a big place. And how am I going to make a difference there? God doesn't necessarily mean the world when he says the world to you. What he means is your world. He means your sphere of influence. He means the people that you come into contact with every single day. You can be a difference maker to those that are closest to you. Not just geographically, <laughs> but relationally. Hey, parents, let me ask you something. Do you point your kids towards Jesus or towards the world? Do you point your kids, the way you act, what you do, what you get involved with, what they see you doing, are you pointing them to Jesus or are you pointing them to the world? It got real quiet in here. That's okay. I'm just asking because we are supposed to be pointing people and we're supposed to be making a difference to those that are closest to us. Genesis 7-1, the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark. The ark is the picture of salvation. It's the picture of hiding. It's the picture of the foundation, the rock that we hide beneath. It's the picture of that. You and your whole family come into this place of protection, come into this place of salvation because I have found you righteous in this generation. You, but because of you, you're gonna influence your whole family. There's this crazy doctrine that goes around that says because you got saved, now all of a sudden all of your kids and family get saved at the same time just because you got saved. In other words, they ride your coattails to heaven. That's not right. But the Bible does say that when you get saved, you are supposed to use the freedom and the life and the energy and the Bible and the word of God and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to change the people when you walk in the front door. (laughs) But that can be hard. That can be really difficult sometimes. Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. At first, in Genesis 7, he's talking about the family, the son, the daughter, the wife, the husband. That's what he's talking about. In Acts chapter 16, he says you will be saved, you and your household. That word household is a Greek word oikos, which means your sphere of influence. It means the people you go to work with. It means the people you see at the gas station. It means the people that you ride on the road with on 129 on a dead sprint trying to get 85. It, it means the people that you go to rec games with. It means the umpires you scream at. <laughs> it, it, means, it means the families that you see at Kroger and the families you see at Mama K's and the family you see at the cream. It's like the, the families that... That's your sphere of influence. And you can be a difference maker in their lives. What about your coworkers? Hey, businessmen, businesswomen, what about the people that work under you? Are you pointing them to Jesus? Are you pointing them to good things? Are you pointing them to the cross? Or are you pointing them to the world? Because I'm telling you, you need to understand you're a difference maker in that arena, in that area. 
As a church, we want to help you. Hey, we want to help point people to Jesus. That's really what we're all about. That's what we want to do. We want to point people to Jesus. And this Christmas at the movies thing that's coming up, I try not to preach my announcements all the time, but I'm telling you right now, this is a big deal. You want to know why? Because there are two times a year people will come to church, Easter and Christmas. We call them Christmas and Easter only Christians, CEOs. That's what we call them, Christmas and Easter only. They'll come to church two times a year. This thing right here, all I'm asking is you invite a, a, somebody that's far from God. You invite somebody you know that needs Jesus, and that's all you've got to do, and let, let us worry about the hard work. Let, let us be the one to present the gospel. Let us use our gifts and our talents from this stage and present the gospel to them, but I'm telling you, you need to invite them to church, and when you invite them to church, and at the very end of the service, I'm going to say, everybody, bow your heads and close your eyes, and we're going to get ready to do the salvation call. You need Jesus. It's that moment. I give you permission to open one eye. And look, you want to know what the best Sunday of your life is? The Sunday you gave your life to Jesus, if it was a Sunday. But the best Sunday of your life is when you invited somebody to church and they gave their life to Jesus. That is the best Sunday of your life. And you've got three great services, opportunities to do that. We're going to give you tickets to hand out all the whole shebang. It's going to be great. You know, there's a lot of pressure on, on our staff and on myself with these Christmas at the movies thing. Last year... We were doing one of our movies. It was Christmas vacation, family, you know, Christmas vacation. And, and we had Cousin Ed and the broken down RV out the front and the cat getting fried under the chair over here. Like we had it all, smoke and everything. We decked this church out for this Christmas event. And um, this one guy comes up to me. He says, hey, pastor. I didn't really know him that well. So I was like, hey, buddy, how are you? You know? And he said, he said, I brought six of my family members today. I was like, that's great. He went, don't blow it. <laughs> There's pressure. A lot of pressure going to this thing. <laughs> you can be a difference maker for those that are closest to you. And I think inviting them to Christmas at the movies is a great way to do it. But you can also be a difference maker in your generation. Just like David was. He did the purpose, did the plan God had for his generation, and then he fell asleep. Jeremiah fifteen nineteen says, you are to influence them, the people, the world. You are not to be influenced by them. They are not to influence you. We are supposed to influence the generation we're in right now. I don't know what a better way to say it. And I'm telling you that what that means is as Christians, we don't stay quiet. As Christians, we get shoved into a corner. We get shoved on the back pew. We get shoved in the back row. Who cares what you think? Who cares what's going on? I'm telling you, I've been called to be loud and proud and be a changer of my generation. That's what I've been called to be. Now, I'm not going to do it wrong. I'm not going to do it in a, in a, in a, in a, a, a bad, boisterous kind of way, but I'm telling you, I'm called to be the change. In other words, if I don't believe in something, it's my job to stand up and say, that's wrong. That's wrong. There's a bill that is in circulation right now that will come to the floor of the House and Senate to be voted on, and at that point, they will allow you to do partial, uh, not, not partial birth, full birth abortions. 30 minutes after a baby is born, you can abort that baby. That's wrong. I just held my little girl, the fourth one, final, thank God, the fourth one. <laughs> and, I, and, and 30 minutes, I'm sitting there going, how is that, how is that right? You got to stand up for the ones that don't have a voice. You got to stand up for the ones that are weak. You got to stand up for those people, right? <laughs> We've got to be the change. You've got to change your generation. Some of y'all need to run for office. Dog catcher, I don't care. Run for office. City council. Run for the school board. Let's, let's allow God to use what he's given us to change our generation. Lindsay, you can come. But there's one reason why we don't. I found. As I, as I was praying about this and this sermon and this moment, there's, there's one thing that I found is the reason why we don't accomplish what God wants us to do in Jackson County. Now, I'll just go ahead and tell you, we've done a pretty good job. I could give you numbers. I could rattle off facts. I could rattle off things that, that, that have happened at this church since um, 2015, 2016, and the ways we have used our influence and used things to change community and use it to change the way that community was shifting or people, and we've changed people's lives. I'm telling you, as a church, you're generous, and that's part of our story, but there's more to do, everybody. There's more to do. Jesus says the poor you will always have with you. You know what that means? You've always got something to do. Come on, say amen right there. As a church, you've always got something to do. We, the Jefferson Church cannot be a social club. We cannot show up 
and get our pew spot and wear our blazer and do our stuff and just then leave and figure out where we're going to lunch. We've got to be the change that changes our world, which is 30549 Jackson County. That's what God's called us to do. Why don't we do it? One word. Fear. Fear. That's why we don't do it. We are afraid. If you're scared, say you're scared. I'm, and sometimes we get afraid. And I'm telling you that that's the biggest reason why sometimes I believe Jackson County isn't changed more like it should be. You know, I, I pray oftentimes for revival to hit our county, to hit our city, to hit Commerce and Talmo and Pendergrass and Arcade and Brazelton and Hushton. Like I, I pray for God to change those things, to, 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 for revival to hit. You know what revival looks like? It doesn't necessarily look like people running all over the church and screaming and shouting and bobby pins flying and hitting windows. That's, that's not necessarily what it means. What revival really looks like is a turn towards God, a change, something that goes in the direction of him. And Matthew 9 says Jesus actually mentions Jackson County in the Bible. Did you know that? It's crazy. I love it when God mentions me specifically in the Bible. I, I, I highlight those verses because it's like all my promises to Nick are in Jesus, yes, and in Jesus, amen. Like, I love those. He mentions Jackson County. <laughs> it, makes, it makes a quick introduction right here in Matthew 9, 37. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is a green light. The harvest is ready to go. Hey, we're looking for people to come to Jesus. Guess what? Jackson County is sitting there waiting to be taken. But the laborers, the believers, the churches are too muddled and too uh, just filled up with their own stuff that they don't see what's playing right in front of them. That the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. So why are we afraid to really go after this? I'm, and after this, I'm done. The reason why we don't see God's gifting on the inside of us and the reason why we don't use it to change Jackson County. Again, I know the world. I know international missions. I get it. Don't send me a nasty email today. I'm just letting you know. Today, as far as this church, our core values, we focus on the world that's in front of us, which is Jackson County, Right? Why don't we do it? Because, number one, we're afraid of our past. We disqualify ourselves before, before anybody ever gets a chance to. We disqualify ourselves. I, I'm telling you, people look at me and I say, hey, you can do this. No, 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 you don't know what I've done. <laughs> you don't know how many marriages I've burned through, Pastor Nick. I'm not, I'm not the guy. Hey, you don't know my resume. Hey, you don't, you don't know all of my issues. Hey, guess what, everybody? We all got to screw loose somewhere, okay? That's just the, it's just the fact of the matter. You, and some, some people would even say, you don't know what I did last night. God can't use me. You know, the funny thing about Jesus using people is when Jesus showed up in bodily and put on a skin suit in human form on this earth, do you know who he used? It wasn't the preachers. <laughs> it wasn't the spiritual elite. It was the screw loose people. It was the cut ears off and ask questions later people. Right? That's who he used. So you disqualify yourself, but I'm telling you, when, when Jesus built his team, he used common, everyday people. Let me tell you something. Your past does not disqualify you. I'm going to say that one more time, and you've got to hear this. What you did back then before today does not disqualify you from God using you. It doesn't. And you can use that as an excuse, or you can just say you're scared because that's what you really are. You're afraid of your past. Because I'm telling you, there are hurting people that need to hear from people who've been hurt the same way they're hurting. I can only reach so many people in so many ways. But if you've been divorced and you've walked through that season of your life, you can help people going through a divorce better than I ever could. You've handled drug addiction in your life and you, God's delivered you from that. You can touch the drug addict that just got a needle out of their skin better than I ever could. He uses past. He uses messed up people to do the great things to accomplish that work. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, God's gifts and God's call are under full warranty. They're never canceled, never rescinded. They are irrevocable. You know what that means? The moment he puts it in your body, it's sown there and nothing you can do can take it away, take it away from your life. It can be used no matter when, no matter where. So I want you to see this as, as we kind of move forward. If you really want to serve God and you really want to change things, you're going to have to let go of your past so that your past can let go of you. You've got to let go of stuff. You've got, to, you've got to stop being afraid. If you're scared, say you're scared and let God work on you. Number two, the second thing we are afraid, we're, a lot of people are just afraid of what people think. <laughs> I'm afraid of what they'll say. 
I'm afraid of what my friends will think. I'm afraid of what people think. Have, have you ever seen the people in the Bible that had they thought about what people thought, it wouldn't have happened? Like, for instance, Noah. God said, I want you to build a boat. Noah said, what's a boat? God said, it's going to rain. Noah said, what's rain? I want you to use a hammer. What's a hammer? You know, like, like he said, I want you to do all these things you've never seen, never known before, and I want you to start building something that people will not understand. And the Bible says they made fun of him for it. The crowd was not okay with it. But guess what? When the rain came down, the floods came up. His house was saved. And you're afraid of the crowd. How about Moses? Moses walks up to the Red Sea, spreads his arms, the Red Sea opens up. What would happen if we had a church event at Lake Lanier and I stepped up to the edge and I went, you would look at me like you are crazy. But if God's spoken to me, if God's given me something that I can't get away from, if God has placed that on the inside of me, I don't care what people think. I don't care what's going on. And I'm telling you, some of you, some of you in this room, when a worship song comes on, you need to look like you're part in the Red Sea because God needs to do something great in your life. He really does. I believe that. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man will prove to mess you up. It'll mess you up every single time. But whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. The, the phrase that I want to bring across is that you have to be more concerned about obeying God than looking foolish. More concerned with obeying God than looking foolish. Sometimes in worship, we're afraid we're looking foolish. That's why a lot of us, I can see you on the edge of your seats, just waiting, just ready. Okay, I might raise my hand, I might raise my hand, might, oh, they look my direction, I'm not going to do it today. Like, I, I see that. There's a dynamic of that that I see. And I felt that. I understand exactly where you're coming from. But can I just tell you something? We ain't looking at you. Now, that's bad English, but that's good preaching, everybody. We ain't looking at you. We ain't looking at you. I am worried about myself and my relationship with God. I could care a hoot about what you are doing. So go ahead and get you some. Go ahead and lift your hands. Go ahead and worship God the way you should. I'm not worried about you, and guess what? Nobody else is either. Give God praise, everybody. Come on. Third thing. Third thing. We are afraid of taking that first step. (laughs) That first step. Because it's the hardest one, right? Chanel and I are different in, in a lot of ways. But the way we get into a pool is very, very different. She Ooh, it's, I don't want, nope, nope. And sometimes she will not get in the pool just because she put her toe in there and it was too cold. Come on, ladies. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody. She, no, I'm not doing it. But when she gets into a pool, it looks painful. Ooh, uh, oh, uh, right? It's like that first step's hard to go. You know what Nick Dalton does? Want to know why? It's going to hurt for about five seconds, but then it's going to be just fine. Body's going to acclimate. I'm going to be okay. All I'm telling you is take the first step. Take the first step. And listen, if you want to do the ooh, ee, ah, ee, if you want to do that, that's fine. But dive in. Growth track part one was today. Part two's next week. Dive in. Get serving. Have revival come to your life and your house. Don't be afraid to take the first step. Hebrews 11, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, you know what he did? He picked up a hammer. When he was warned and God said, in holy fear, build an ark to save your family, he picked up the hammer. He took the first step. And by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You have to step out. You have to step out to find out. That's for somebody here today. Some of y'all, you sitting there, and you sitting there physically and spiritually. You got to step out if you want to find out. Last thing, and I'm done. We are afraid of failure. We're afraid of failure. What keeps us from having this fear of failing? Well, it should be God's promises, right? Genesis chapter 9, he's talking to Noah. He says, hey, Noah, he says, I placed a rainbow in the clouds as a sign of my promise until the end of time to you and to all the earth. What is part of that promise? Jesus states it, Matthew 28, 20, watch this. He says, I will be with you even until the end of the age. I'll be with you no matter what. And sometimes we're afraid to fail, but just as I asked before, is God faithful? Somebody say yes. Is God faithful? Does he reward those who seek him? Is he going to be there when you pray? When you open up your word, is the Holy Spirit sitting there waiting on you to respond to you? Yes. If all those things are true, how are you going to fail? If God is for you, who's going to put anything up against you? How's that, how's that going to work? It's not going to prosper whatsoever. God's called us. 
to be difference makers, to change the world. And through our church, we believe our value is we empower people to use their God-given gifts to change Jackson County. You know what changing Jackson County looks like? Since 2018, we've had a lot of new people at the church. and So maybe you know this story, maybe you don't. But I was driving down the road of commerce one day. I was going to talk to somebody. It was actually the first conversation I had outside of our elders with somebody talking about the mill, talking about the new facility that we're getting ready to go to. And as I was going there, I had a lot of things on my mind, and I got behind a school bus. Now, how many of you know, number one, you're in a hurry to get somewhere. Number two, there's a school bus in front of you. God's mad at you. Like, that's basically what it, that's, that's what it equates to me. You know, I'm like, stop, go, stop, go. One comes out, stop, sign out, blinking lights, all that. You get a headache just thinking about it. And I'm on this back road of commerce, and this one stop comes out, and this little boy just bounds off the bus. And he comes running over to his mom and hugs his mom. Mom hugs him. It's just such a great Hallmark, you know, Oprah Winfrey channel kind of moment. It was just, it was great, you know. And they go into the house, and, and I'm going along my way thinking about stuff, and the Holy Spirit stops me and says, hey, stop and ask them if they need anything. You know what I said? No. <laughs> I'm in a hurry. Pastor Nick, I thought you were saved. I messed up just like everybody else sometimes. He said, stop. So I turned around, went in the driveway, saw the car held up by duct tape and a hanger, coat hanger wire. I went up to the front door, knocked on the front door. She looks through the window, and I, and I could tell just her life. You could you just tell life had gotten to this lady. And she said, she said can I help you? And I said, no, 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 I, I want to help you. Anything you need, I left her my card. And I came, I came away, kind of talked to her about some things she needed. I came back to you guys, and I said, hey, guys, there's this lady named Mary, and she really needs our help. She's got a, a son with special needs. She's got a little girl that goes to middle school, and she gets made fun of because she doesn't have the right clothes, and they can't afford the right clothes. They're living in a bug-infested apartment. They really can't afford food. They can't afford to go anywhere because their car is completely shot. There's no way anything can happen. She is stuck where she is. Her husband committed suicide years in 2016, I believe it was, left her all alone with these two kids by herself. Do you, know what, do you want to know what changing Jackson County looks like? It's that right there. It's changing people. And I'm telling you, God's called you to use your gifts to change people like Mary. But guess what? You meet Marys every single day. You meet Marys every single day. And you know, as a church, you don't want to know why I know you're generous? We bought that gal a car, a nice car. It was nice. It wasn't, eh, it was a nice car. We gave her over $20,000 worth of insurance, premiums paid for, clothes, food uh, gift cards, gas gift cards. I mean, like, we, we really, toys for the kids, we really, really gave it all to them. Why? Not because we're fancy, not because we want God to do something to, uh, for us or we want some recognition. We do it because God has called us to change Jackson County. That's how you do it. But you meet Mary's every day. What's God speaking to you? Who are the people in your sphere? Who are the people in your world? Who are the people in your influence that God's called you to change? That's what today's about. Bow your heads and close your eyes just for a second. Values, values. That's our core value, our core value, our core value. We believe that God's called us to empower people to use their spiritual gifts, use what God's put on the inside of them, the unique thing, the thing that makes them different to change the lives of people in Jackson County. I want to ask you today, are you, are you about the business of doing that? Have you been so focused on you and yourself and your life and your problems and your issues that you forgot about the Marys of Jackson County? You forgot about the Marys of Commerce? You forgot about the Marys of Talmo and Pendergrass? And has God put those people in your life? When you walk to a Kroger and you see a single mom that's getting ready to pay for those groceries and God says, hey, I want you to go pay for it, that's that Mary that you need to go help. That's that person that you need to go reach out and speak to. So I want to ask you, who's got to put on your life? Who's got to put on your heart? Before we go any further, I do want to say that if there's somebody in this room, you need to give your life to Jesus. Hey, this whole mentality, this whole pointing people to Jesus, this whole idea of there's a, something greater than myself that I'm supposed to live for, it all comes from a life of Jesus. Aren't you tired of just living life based on you? and how empty that is, and how awful that feels, and how when you are based on you, you will let you down every single time. But my Bible says God's faithful, and I can trust him. 
You're here today and you say, I don't know if I were to die today, whether I would live or die, whether I'd go to heaven or where I'd go to hell. I, I don't know where I'm going. I need to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender my life to Jesus today. I want to commit my life. I want a fresh start with him. That's me, Pastor Nick. The Holy Spirit is convicting me. And right now, I need to give my life to Jesus. I'm not going to call you down to the front. I'm not going to embarrass you. But right where you're seated, you say, I want to give my life to Jesus. Could you just lift your hand up? Nobody looking around. That's you. There's one. Anybody else? Come on, anybody else? I see one. I'll, I'll take one all day. The Bible says that he left the 99 for the one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. One person giving their life to Jesus today, everybody. Isn't that awesome? Two people giving their life to Jesus today, everybody. Isn't that awesome? Say, I'm committing my life, surrendering my life to Jesus. Two people. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. I want to ask you that after this prayer, that if you lifted your hand, you would take a connect card in front of you, put your name, your information down, say, I got saved, hand it to one of our door holders on your way out. We would love to just help you with your next steps, get in touch with you, and help you with this journey that you're beginning with Jesus today. But to confess with your mouth and believe in your hearts, that's what's the most important. So I want to ask you out loud, with your mouth, say this, there's something about a physical encounter with something that's happening spiritual on the inside. Uh, so I want you to say it if you lifted your hands. But everybody in the room, we're now church family. They're a part of the family of God. We're going to say it right along with them. So if you said this, I want you to say it out loud as everybody says it out loud. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Come on, say it like you mean it. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, all of my mistakes, everything I've done wrong. None of it matters from this point forward because I'm giving my life to Jesus. Thank you that you bought me. Thank you that you died for me. You are the Son of God. You rose on the third day. You're coming back for me one day, and I believe it with all my heart. Again, I surrender. Come on, say, I surrender. I give my life to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Hey, two people just gave their life to Jesus. Isn't that awesome? We are so excited that you joined us today. If you gave your life to Jesus this morning, we would love to know about it. You can email us at office at jefferson.church. We can't wait to see you next week.